Are we here? Is it working? So I'm going to make a start. Welcome to today's Earth Live lesson, which is all about the world's slowest and quite possibly strangest mammal, the sloth. Um, for everyone that is already here, if you've got any questions about sloths, or maybe you've got a fact of your own that you'd like to share, drop it in the comments and I'll try and uh, read them and answer as many questions as I can at the end of the lesson. So um, first time to introduce myself. Um, I'm Lucy and like most of the people here delivering these live lessons, I have always had a real passion for wildlife, um, but I've particularly always been interested in the weirder side of wildlife. When I was a kid, I was obsessed with insects and I've always loved things like frogs and toads and fungi, basically anything that anyone thinks is weird, I love. Um, and one of my newfound uh, favorite weirdos, if you like, is the sloth. I've kind of fallen in love with them over the past uh, two years or so. And the main reason is because of my job. I am the digital content producer for the Sloth Appreciation Society. Um, and so I spend a lot of my time uh, managing social media and researching and writing about sloths as well as filming and editing videos to educate people about them and tell them why they behave the way that they do and how they interact with the ecosystems around them. So before I get started I have a challenge for everyone here. I have a leaf here that I picked in my back garden and uh, what I'm asking you to take a guess at is how long do you think a, it takes a three-toed sloth to digest a leaf like this? Um, you probably already know that leaves make up the most part of sloth's diet, but how long do you think it takes a three-toed sloth to digest this? Um, you can answer in, in days, in weeks, in hours, whichever you think is closest to the right answer. Leave your answer in the comments and we will come back to that a bit later on. But on to sloths. There are two distinct groups of sloths, and the first one is the three-toed Bradipus sloths. Um, and the second group are the two-toed Coloepus sloths. Now, these two groups, although they might look quite similar to us and behave similarly, um, they are very, very different. In fact, they're as genetically different as cats and dogs. In fact, us humans have more in common uh, to baboons than those two groups of sloths do to each other. But how can you tell the two groups apart? Well, the main difference uh, you can see in their claws. Uh, and it's all to do with how many claws they have on their front paws. So it's quite self-explanatory. The two-toed sloths have two claws on each of their front paws and the three-toed sloth has three. So um, on to species then. A lot of people are surprised when I tell them that there are six species of sloth. Two belong to the two-toed group and four belong to the three-toed group. So let's whisk through some of those. The most abundant species is this one here. It's the Hoffman's two-toed sloth. Um, and as you can see, it's got a sort of piggish-like snout. And there are other ways that you can tell the two different groups of sloth apart, um, in addition to the number of claws that they've got on their front feet. And this is one of the main, the main things, is their pig-like noses. The three-toed sloths have kind of small button-like noses, um, and also these don't have a tail, three-toed sloths do. So this is the Hoffman's two-toed sloth and the second species of two-toed sloth is this, the Linnaeus's two-toed sloth. Now you might think that these two look quite similar but if you look more closely at the fur and the skin colour on this one it's slightly darker and if you have ever seen a two-toed sloth in the zoo it probably was a Linnaeus's two-toed sloth because this is the species that's most commonly kept in captivity. So uh, on to the three-toed sloths. Now this is the most widespread species and probably the species that comes to mind when somebody says sloth and it's the brown-throated sloth. Um, this 
as I said, is the most widespread of all the sloth species. And similar to that one is the pale-throated sloth. The difference between these is this very distinct um, pale, creamy yellow facial disc that this one has. And then one of my favourites, I've not seen one of these, but it looks like someone's got a coconut and drawn a smiley face on it. It's the main sloth. These can only be found along the eastern coast of Brazil. And then we have one of the weirdest species, and this is the pygmy sloth. Now this photo is actually a photo of a brown-throated sloth, but the reason I've chosen this is because the pygmy sloth and the brown-throated sloth look very, very similar. And this cardboard cutout is actually more or less to scale with a fully grown pygmy sloth. They are tiny. This is about the size of a fully grown adult pygmy sloth. They're 40% smaller than the brown-throated sloth, and they can only be found living on a single tiny island just off the coast of Panama. So a question that I get asked a lot about sloths is why are they so slow? I've even had people say to me, what's the point in them? What do they do? They just sleep all day. Um, but I'll have you know that sloths are slow for a reason and it's actually the secret to their success. Um, being slow is an adaptation to their very limited low calorie diets. We've mentioned these leaves. These make up the most part of a sloth's diet and of course they're not very high in energy. But you might be thinking, well why can't the sloth just eat more? Um, surely if they eat more leaves they get more energy and they can move faster. Well it's not as simple as that because the leaves that they eat in the jungles of Central America are not only really tough and hard to digest, they're also packed full of toxins. So if a sloth ate loads of these leaves, the toxins would build up in its system and it could potentially poison itself. So eating more is not an option. What have they done to cope? They have to live on around 160 calories a day, which is about the same as a packet of crisps for us. Um, and they do so using all of these bizarre adaptations that they've evolved over time. So I'm going to talk a bit about those. And the first is something that we can't see. It's in the sloth's muscles. Sloths have unusual muscles because they're biologically designed to be 15, up to 15 times more sluggish than the muscles of a similarly sized mammal like a domestic cat. They also have 50% less muscle mass than your uh, similar than a similar sized mammal. And then the second thing, which we can see quite clearly, if you take a look at your fingernail, I don't know what you if you know what substance that's made of, um, but the our fingernails and the claws of most other mammals are made of a material called keratin. Now, um, sloths obviously don't go along with the norm. Their claws are different to most other mammals. I've got here a picture of a brown-throated sloth skeleton. Um, and if you take a look at the claws, you might just be able to see that they're made of bone. What these are, sloth claws, are basically elongated finger bones that stick out through the, the, the skin. But why have they got this weird adaptation um, they, they have this because uh, it makes their claws stronger and what it allows them to do is to hang onto a branch, hook onto a branch and just kind of hang there upside down for hours and hours and expend hardly any energy. Of course hanging around upside down uses a lot less energy than moving around upright like we do. Um, so the next thing is their thick fur. Their bodies are covered in this thick fur um, that keeps them warm and means they don't have to spend as much energy keeping uh, their, their bodies warm and maintaining a constant internal uh, body temperature. And then if we go back to the skeleton, you can see this unusually long neck here. Now another interesting fact about sloths is that they have more vertebrae, so more bones in their neck than even a giraffe. Now what this allows them to do, these three-toed sloths, is to hang upside down on the branches like they do and swivel their heads around 270 degrees so they can graze the leaves all around without having to move the rest of their bodies at all. So that's another trick and they also have really slow metabolisms which basically means every single chemical process in their body um, 
happens quite slowly and this saves further energy. So back to the leaf, the slow metabolism means a slow rate of digestion. So I asked some of you to guess how long uh, it took, it would take a three toed sloth to digest a leaf like this. Kevin has guessed one week. Well, you might be surprised to know that it's even longer than that. It's four times as long as that. It takes a sloth 30 days to digest just one leaf um, an entire month. So hopefully that gives you an idea of how slow their digestive systems really are. So these adaptations have enabled sloths to become a really successful and abundant group of animals, even though on the surface they might look a bit lazy to us. But of course, when an animal like a sloth is so finely adapted to its environment, when these environments are somehow altered by humans, that's when sloths can start to struggle. So another common question that I get asked is, are sloths endangered? And sadly, Two of the six species alive today are, this is the uh, main sloth, which has been classified as vulnerable to extinction by the IUCN. And also, let me find him, the pygmy sloth, who uh, they have been just, uh, they have been listed as critically endangered. Um, their island home is coming under threat from climate change, uh, it's causing extreme weather events which is putting pressure on these animals and the island is also at risk of being developed and built on for uh, tourism. Thankfully a group at the Zoological Society of London are working hard to try and protect the pygmy sloth and they also go out I think twice a year to monitor populations on the island and, and keep an eye on their numbers. So um, the other four on official terms, they're not endangered, but they are becoming increasingly threatened by human activity. Now, thanks to my job, I've had the opportunity to get up close and personal with sloths in Central America. And it's taught me a lot, not only about the animals themselves, but also about the different threats that they face in the wild and how they respond to them. So last summer, I spent uh, three months living and working at a wildlife rescue centre in Panama and they specialise in the rescue of the Hoffman's two-toed sloth, that's the right way up I guess for a sloth, and the uh, brown-throated sloth. So they specialise in the rescue and rehabilitation of these guys um, and across Central America the reason why a lot of sloths are brought into uh, sanctuaries like the one that I worked at is because they ended up either injured or orphaned and unfortunately the driving factor behind a lot of these cases is habitat fragmentation. But what is habitat fragmentation? Imagine you've got a huge uh, patch of forest, you've got thousands upon thousands of sloths living there and the population is really genetically diverse. So there's loads of different genes going on, all the sloths are breeding and it's a really happy and healthy population. But then imagine somebody comes along and they build a big road through the middle of it, cutting this once big patch of forest into two smaller sections. And then somebody might come along and plonk a big uh, section of houses in between one of them, dividing it into three. And then this process continues. And what you end up with is um, a group of lots of isolated uh, essentially islands, these habitats that sloths struggle to move in and out of. Um, and, and inbreeding ends up happening, sloths end up with genetic deformities and of course when there are so many uh, houses and roads around, sloths uh, are at increased risk of coming into contact with humans and other dangers, for example roads um, and also sometimes they'll wander into people's gardens and get attacked by domestic dogs or they'll try and climb across power lines and end up being electrocuted. Thankfully when I was in Panama, um, I didn't see any really serious injuries. Uh, the main reason was uh, they were just disorientated. Sloths had wandered into urban areas and you know there's no food there, it's loud, it's a totally alien environment and so they get a bit stressed and we have to go and rescue them and relocate them and take them to somewhere natural and somewhere safe. I actually went to rescue a sloth from somebody's front garden, it was in a big bush in their front garden and um, the interesting thing about this sloth, it was a brown throated sloth by the way, is that it was covered in bugs, but they weren't ordinary bugs, 
they were sloth moths. So the sloth has um, a type of moth, a species of moth that lives only in sloth fur. And I think that each species of sloth has a different species of sloth moth that lives in its fur. And they live there and they feed on the algae that grows on the sloth's fur. And then they actually lay their eggs in the sloth's poo. So when the sloth climbs down to the base of a tree to go to the toilet, the uh, moths lay their eggs in the poo and that's where the larvae develop and then they'll fly up into the canopy, find a sloth and, uh, and the life cycle starts over again. So when we were transporting this sloth from somebody's garden to the nearest national park uh, deep into, into the rainforest, we actually also got covered in sloth moths, which was really itchy. Um, so that was a really amazing experience and that's the good news is there are loads of organizations across south and central america that are working to not only rescue sloths but to also raise money for sloth conservation and raise awareness of sloth conservation issues and to save these species and to preserve their important habitats so on a lighter note what is it like being a surrogate mum to a bunch of orphaned baby sloths um, well, it's actually quite hard work, that's the truth, because they eat so much. Um, the baby sloths that I was looking after had uh, milk, goat's milk, four times a day. Obviously, we can't get hold of sloth milk, and cow's milk actually is really bad for their digestive systems. So uh, they give them goat's milk, and that's that. they digest that nice and easily, and it's full of the nutrients that they need. They would get fed milk at 8 o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock lunchtime, 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. And um, they'd also, on top of that, get four vegetable feeds a day. We'd chop up bits of vegetable into tiny pieces to hand feed them. They'd get carrot, green beans and chayote, which is a type of squash. And of course, sloths wouldn't uh, naturally eat vegetables in the wild. But what this does is it just makes sure that they're getting the right vitamins and nutrients that they need to grow up healthy and strong. Um, the sloths can be really fussy, not just the babies, but also the adults. We'd feed both the babies and the adults uh, plants, which we'd go out to collect. Um, and that was quite an adventure sometimes because the three-toed sloths only eat, they mainly eat the leaves from the cecropia plant, which has a type of fire ant living inside its hollow stems. So when we'd go out and we'd cut big branches off of this tree, we'd end up cover, covered in these biting, stingy little ants. So that was always an adventure, but how else do you keep sloths happy as well as giving them loads and loads of food? Well, the cute answer is to give them a cuddle buddy. Sloths are born to hug. They'll cling on to their mums for the first uh, nine months of their lives, six to nine months of their lives for protection and to feed. Um, and so if they end up orphaned and they're brought into a rescue center, they're often quite uh, distressed. So to keep them feeling safe and secure, what these places do usually is to pair them up, either with a stuffed animal or even cuter, with another sloth. Um, these guys are best buddies and this is what happens. You pair sloths up and even though they're solitary in the world, they form really strong bonds and they will, they will sleep hugging each other and they do everything together. So, um, that's, that's it really. I'm going to move on to some of your questions. Um, Mary asked, this is a good question, what is a sloth's closest relative? So sloths are part of the group Xenarthra, um, along with the anteaters and armadillos. So their closest uh, relative out of the two, I think, is the, is the armadillo, which might surprise you. But if you take a look at a picture, you can see that they've got they've got very similar claws, um, so that's that's the answer to that one. Um, and Kevin asked, "What's the benefit um, of some species, some groups of sloth having two claws and others having three? We don't know. There's so much we don't know about sloths. Um, nobody knows where they climb all the way." down to the base of a tree to go to the toilet. Um, there are a lot of mysteries and that's why it's really important that we kind of, um, we keep studying these animals and keep learning more about them because the more we know about them, not only will we better understand their behavior, but we'll also be able to better conserve them. Alex asked, do all species of sloth have the same number of neck vertebrae? They don't. 
the three-toed sloth, I think, has nine or ten, and the two-toed sloth has slightly less than normal, which I think is about six. So, um, sadly, we're running out of time. If you're wondering how you can help sloths, I'm involved in a really exciting project called Reserva, the Youth Land Trust, and what they're doing is they're working to create the world's first entirely youth-funded nature reserve um, out in Ecuador. And the site that we are protecting is home to the Hoffman's two-toed sloth. So how can you help? If you go away now and you write a letter about why it is you love wildlife and why you think it's important for us to work to protect it, um, you can raise enough money to save a patch of rainforest there in Ecuador, the same the size of a, of a classroom. So that's a really cool way that you can get involved and also get creative. You can use what you've learned today, use what you've learned in the past, um, Earth Live lessons, draw some pictures, write poems, do whatever you want um, and save some rainforest. So I'm going to have to leave now. Thank you all for coming along. It's been fun. Um, if you've got any more questions, in the description is a link, a link to my social media and the Sloth Appreciation Society social media. So you can go over there. And if I didn't get a chance to answer your question, you can send them in um, and I'll get back to you. So thanks for watching. Bye.